Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are joining us from, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Josh from Business Review Webinars, and I will be your host. It is our pleasure to have Nucleus Network with us today, who will be presenting the webinar in total, Keeping Standards High in Phase 1 Clinical Trials. A little bit about Nucleus Network here in front of you. Um, they've been going for 15 plus years, um, over 700 phase one clinical trials completed, and 50% of all trials they've conducted annually are true first in human. A little bit about our speakers today, you've got Cameron Johnson, CEO, Dr. Tricia Champ, Senior Medical Officer, Dr. Paul Griffin, who's a Principal Investigator, Jeff Wong, the Business Development Director. Before we begin, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar platform on 24. You'll notice that this webinar is browser-based, so if you do get disconnect for any reason, please just click on the link that you received and you'll and via email and to rejoin the session. In order to ask questions, you can send them in via the questions widget. Just type them into the box at the top right-hand corner of your screen and click Submit. We'll allocate some time at the end of the session to address any questions or thoughts that you may have had and please use the yellow help widget if you require any assistance and you can move, resize, and maximize any of the windows in front of you to get a better view of the slides. But for now, please allow me to welcome Cameron. Excellent. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and as yeah, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where in the world you are based. So really the purpose of today's presentation is to discuss the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine as it relates to the conduct of clinical trials. With strict inclusion and exclusion criteria that typically exclude participants from entering into a trial if they have recently received a vaccine or if they plan on receiving a vaccine during the course of the trial, the question has to be asked, where does the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine fit into trials that are either currently underway or plan on being conducted during the rollout period. To provide first-hand experience on this question, Nucleus Network Australia has been in the fortunate position of being involved in a large number of first-in-human COVID-19 vaccine studies where we have gained first-hand insight into the platforms and technologies being used to create these vaccines. Nucleus Network USA then has first-hand experience on how the COVID-19 vaccine rollout has impacted clinical trials. Ultimately, this puts Nucleus Network in a very unique pos position of taking both these experiences and being able to put appropriate measures in place for when the rollout of the vaccine takes place for all ages here in Australia. Topics to be covered in this webinar include prioritising participant health and safety without compromising ongoing trials, maintaining completion rates during the rollout phase, expanding communication channels and frequency, obviously ensuring that our participants are kept informed about when they become eligible for the vaccination, and finally, protocol considerations to accommodate the vaccine rollout period. Before we launch into today's webinar, it is worth a quick refresh on the COVID-19 cases in Australia compared to the USA. These contrasts of infection rates has made Australia and continues to make Australia a very attractive destination for clinical trials requiring COVID-19 naive participants. This is uh, particularly relevant for those companies that are continuing into continuing through their preclinical and are looking at moving into their first in human COVID vaccine trials in 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 the future. Then when we compare the rollout of the vaccine in the USA versus Australia, you will note just how far behind Australia is compared to the USA. However, over the course of the next 18 months, the percentage of the population that are vaccinated in Australia should increase dramatically 
And it's important that pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies begin planning now for the vaccine rollout in Australia in order to mitigate enrolment delays. In today's presentation, we will have Dr. Tricia Shan, who is an integral member of our Nucleus Network USA team. Tricia frequently liaises with clients and key, key stakeholders where she has first-hand experience in ensuring study design and study implementation are worked in a manner that maximises the completion potential of the study. She will discuss the benefits and processes that she has found successful in this endeavour. Associate Professor Paul Griffin is one of Nucleus Network's principal investigators who has overseen more than 100 clinical trials, as well as a large number of COVID-19 vaccine and treatment studies. Paul will discuss how cross-continental learnings can be shared to optimise the Australian approach. And finally, Jeffrey Wong is Nucleus Network's Director of Business Development. Jeff will tie these threads together and explain the advantages of considering a multi-site approach during the vaccine rollout. I'll now hand over to Tricia um, as our first speaker to dive into this topic. Thanks, Tricia. Thank you for that introduction, Cameron. So I'm going to start off by talking about vaccine rollout and integration here in the United States and specifically in our state of Minnesota. When I look at this slide, I think of the challenges that we have all faced conducting clinical trials during this pandemic. And while these challenges certainly make dealing with the day-to-day -day life interesting, it's really overcoming these challenges is what makes our lives meaningful working in this industry. And maintaining clinical trial continuity is certainly very meaningful for the future of medicine. And I really don't know a better example of that other than the COVID vaccine itself. From the very beginning, Nucleus Network has provided our customer base meaningful solutions to keep their clinical trial programs ongoing throughout all phases of the pandemic. And we did this by taking a very close look at the protocols we had in the feasibility stage, as well as trials that were ongoing that we knew were going to be affected by vaccine rollout. We looked at the investigational product, how the protocols were worded, the inclusion exclusion criteria, and even how sponsors might interpret um, the wording because the vaccine is uh, approved under emergency use authorization and how they may interpret that as an investigational product within their specific protocol. We reached out very early to our customers as well as our key contacts at regulatory bodies here in the U.S. to discuss this as we are often asked early to help in protocol development or you know drafting amendments sponsors wanted our assistance in incorporating language that would support vaccine administration in their protocols if it was safe. Here in the United States, rollout took a two-phased approach. Phase one having many layers and phase two rollout being to the general population and it has been very accelerated. The federal government essentially turned over vaccine rollout and timelines to each individual state to manage. So there really was no uniform approach. In Minnesota, Nucleus Network has always been very active within our local and state community and government agencies. And we are a strategic partner within our community, having provided insight on COVID risk mitigation, assistance on strategic planning for vaccine rollout, as well as we have done a lot of important community education on clinical trials, demystifying clinical research. Everyone is very interested in clinical trials now as it relates to the vaccine. We've done a lot of community education on the vaccine pharmacology itself. We feel it's very important to not only do good within our four walls, but also translate our good um, out into the community. And that strategic partnership within the community really proved 
very advantageous for us and our customers as we had early visibility as to specific timelines for each phase of rollout. Phase one prioritized vaccine administration to our frontline healthcare workers, and that allowed us to get our staff vaccinated very quickly. Then rollout um, came to uh, people ages 65 um, and those younger with certain comorbidities. And this was also very important for us to have visibility on because not only do we conduct a lot of healthy volunteer studies in Minneapolis, we are really um, a sought after site to complete complicated renal and hepatic pharmacokinetic phase one protocols, which can be very difficult to execute from a recruitment perspective, but also given the medical vulnerability of my partic these participants, we wanted a plan to ensure their safe participation. They have a deep level of trust with us. And many of these participants were calling to get um, their questions answered about the vaccine or how getting the vaccine may um, impact their trial participation. It's interesting that the renal and hepatic population, their motivations to do studies are, are not financial. They're very altruistic, and they were concerned about how this may impact their ability to do studies. It also became very clear and evident early on that the state of Minnesota was going to have one of the most accelerated vaccine allocation programs in the country. Uh, which we anticipated potentially being an issue with our healthy volunteer studies. So that prompted us to act swiftly um, to evaluate uh, the, the individual protocols and how they may be affected. Right now, 45% of our population is fully vaccinated. Over 50% of the population has received at least one dose. And I would say 95 to near almost 100% of our special population database is vaccinated. And maybe 60 to 70% of our healthy volunteers are uh, vaccinated as well. We have found that to be extremely positive for our recruitment as people are more comfortable moving about the community and considering inpatient stays in a clinical trial facility having had their vaccine. So one of the aspects that really sets Nucleus Network apart is our ability to be constantly forward thinking. Our senior management really empowers us to go find the answers and pave a path forward where you know, no one has really gone before in this situation. Just as we were the benchmark for COVID risk mitigation early on in the pandemic, being one of the first phase one sites to implement PCR testing, on-site antigen testing for our sponsors and participants, we also knew that we needed a plan for integrating vaccine administration with ongoing trial conduction. So one of the very first things we did was sit down with our largest pharmaceutical sponsors. We literally picked up the phone, called the key opinion leaders, the decision makers, and had an old school roundtable intellectual discussion where we all voiced our interpretation, questions, concerns, and it was amazing the comprehensive vaccine allocation algorithm and plan that came out of that, which not only aligned with their individual protocols, but it was also one that we were able to translate to other sponsors. Because as I said earlier, we had a lot of sponsors coming to us looking for answers. They were asking, what are other people doing? What's your experience? You know, How are we gonna manage that? Because they wanted their trial to continue. Um, and when they asked those questions, we were able to provide those answers. At Nucleus Network, we have a long-standing and trust-based relationship with our sponsors and our participants. The communication flow is very collaborative. It's not just one-sided email. It is picking up the phone. It's having that personal relationship on both sides. 
And the team of scientific experts that we have within the Nucleus organization allows us to have a very intricate understanding of complex pharmacology, immunology, vaccine studies, as Cameron um, discussed, as well as the general complexities of integrating all of these things into conducting a phase one study with strict adherence to ICH and GCP guidelines. When we take a trial on at Nucleus, our sponsor's drug really becomes our passion. And the same thing with our volunteers, their safety and journey during the entire process is, is so critical. And so for us becoming knowledge experts in the areas that affect the protocol or our participants is a priority goal. We have found that frequent and concise communication with our sponsors has been critical to maintaining their confidence. Same thing with my volunteer, with our volunteers. Um, it maintains a more fluid trial execution. And one of the, the final things and something very important um, that I wanted to mention was the amount of education that went into training our recruitment officers by creating tools for them to use to reference uh, each specific vaccine requirement or restriction for the protocol, making that very user friendly for them, as well as, and probably just as important, getting the medical team involved early with the recruitment officers to step in and ask questions, discuss questions or concerns with our participants, call them back, speak with them directly. Um, and that has really contributed to a very positive streamlined approach for trial conduction across um, all, of, all of our sites really. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Paul Griffin. Uh, thanks very much. And uh, look, it's, it's been great to hear about uh, how successful things have been conducted in the, the US. Um, in terms of my discussion now, obviously um, the robustness of the response as an organization has been very similar uh, here in Australia or in Brisbane, more specifically where I'm located. But that's been in the context of, I guess, a very different situation, both in terms of the, the virus and our, our vaccine rollout. I'm also an infectious diseases physician and microbiologist, so it certainly has been a, a busy time for me personally. And fortunately, I've been able to use some of those skills to to uh, come up with that response that we've heard to make sure that we keep all of our uh, participants and importantly our staff as well um, very safe. In terms of uh, COVID-19 in Australia, we've been very fortunate to have that under excellent control essentially from the outset. So as a country, we're still less than 30,000 cases and, and less than 1,000 deaths. And, and while obviously that's fantastic news, it has in many ways impacted our, our vaccine rollout. And we are, I guess, one of the countries that are uh, right at the bottom of that rollout situation compared to uh, everybody else. So at the moment, I think we have uh, nearly 4 million doses administered, but that's uh, just over 400,000 people fully vaccinated with a uh, fully vaccinated percentage of uh, less than 2%. So as I say, far behind many other countries. We also had a multi-tiered approach but perhaps one that was a, a little more complicated, involving first of all, people at highest risk of uh, acquiring the virus, followed closely by people at, uh, I guess, higher risk of more severe disease. And so understanding that uh, tiered approach to our rollout and uh, I guess the sluggish speed at which our rollout was progressing has been integral in terms of us planning studies, both in terms of the timing, but also the uh, populations we're going to enrol, the specific inclusion exclusion criteria, and very importantly, the, the assessments on those studies, as well as how to communicate in a very dynamic way the, the ever-evolving situation uh, around us. So some of the things we had to consider in terms of uh, the protocol um, was uh, obviously we had to take into account many things around us that we didn't have control over and therefore have contingencies to make sure that we can conduct studies safely and successfully in such a fluid environment where things are prone to changing very quickly. And in our country at the moment, we have recently seen a, a, 
a slight but significant surge in cases, which has meant that state is in a lockdown. And, you know, once again, we've had to have a, a fluid and dynamic response to be able to continue to operate safely and successfully in that context. I mean, some of the factors that we've had to consider and, and communicate very regularly, both with our sponsors as well as our participants, is the current situation with the virus changes in vaccine eligibility and and again that's happening almost on a daily basis here at the moment we've also had to have uh, um, ways of assessing our subjects for covid in such a manner that they're not exposing any of our staff or other volunteers to any risk so it's meant a little bit of a change in terms of being able to assess our volunteers externally relying on uh, teleconferencing or uh, or telephone calls where perhaps previously we might have had face-to-face -face reviews and even uh, uh, enabling our volunteers to have uh, COVID testing perhaps off-site if that's a, a safer way to do things so that we can then make sure they're negative before we bring them on-site. But also obviously factoring into all of these things in addition to, to particularly safety and, and the COVID things is being able to make sure in, in that context, in that fluid environment, that we can still get the maximum information for our sponsors from each and every participant in our trials. And that's meant being able to, I guess, again, be agile in terms of how we, uh, we do some of those assessments. So in terms of uh, evaluating options, you know, as always, um, and uh, you know, in accordance with uh, a lot of governing principles in clinical trials, including GCP, that the safety of our participants has remained our highest priority. Um, we obviously want to make sure that they remain safe, but still need to have capability to assess them, you know, both per protocol and particularly if uh, there was uh, any safety concerns. We also need to keep our staff safe, obviously for their sake, but also to ensure that we can continue to operate and continue to assess our subjects should the need arise and to make sure we can continue to do our, our studies safely. And what that meant was uh, basically bringing in a number of infection control principles and perhaps doing this, I guess, before they were, were brought in more broadly and um, maybe even before they were brought into some of our healthcare settings. So this meant obviously assessing their risk with uh, some pre-screening, particularly when COVID was very geographically isolated at the outset, uh, utilising temperature scanning um, for, for staff as well as uh, visitors and, and volunteers, trying to have some of our staff work remotely. And this has meant also that, uh, you know, consideration of things like remote monitoring where, where it's appropriate. Uh, relying very heavily on the use of masks, and we've certainly done this uh, far in excess of what uh, you know our, our peer healthcare organisations that provide clinical services locally have done. And again, obviously, utilising testing. Um, we haven't had quite the same requirement for, for regular testing um, on site routinely, but certainly making sure that anybody that has any potentially compatible symptoms um, gets, uh, we certainly facilitate rapid testing so that we can uh, either confirm or exclude. COVID to, to make sure they're safe, but also keep everybody else uh, in the unit safe as well. Um, in terms of um, continuation and uh, consideration of people potentially trying to get their vaccine, obviously we have to consider the public health implications of vaccination, and we certainly don't want to defer that, particularly if someone is at high risk, um, but obviously consider getting the maximum data on our on our studies and what that potentially means it is if it's safe to do so um, occasionally our volunteers have uh, delayed vaccination um, for a period of time that's potentially practical but if they are eligible typically we've encouraged them to get the vaccine at first opportunity but again we've enabled changes in the protocols and systems and processes such that we we see them they we maintain communication channels and see them as close to immediately prior to getting that vaccine as possible. So once again, we can collect some information um, on whatever the investigational product is, particularly if it's impacted by receiving the vaccine. Uh, so that, as I say, we get the maximum uh, amount of information possible. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, communication channels, as I say, in such a fluid environment with so many moving parts, to, to make sure we can do this, we need to have basically almost continuous communication, uh, both with our sponsors, um, potentially our regulators, uh, but particularly with our, our participants so that uh, they know what is going on around them and what's important from a study perspective, but we also know uh, what's happening from their perspective as well. So again, I mentioned communication channels uh, quite a few times, but this is, I think, the most important factor when doing this. And uh, we've also been very, um, very involved in external communication, um, even outside of directly related to our vaccine studies. It's been very clear there's a lot of misinformation that's circulated on a global scale in terms of vaccines from the fact that the clinical trials have been rushed or there's insufficient data or they're, they're not safe. 
And while that's obviously been really important to explain um, as it relates to individual studies, and we've seen this become very important in terms of recruitment generally in terms of our vaccine studies, it's also something we've contributed to addressing um, more broadly. And, and I think that that's probably had a role in uh, contributing to a, a reduction in vaccine hesitancy and hopefully improving the uptake of even the licensed vaccines in this country as well, uh, even despite our, our slow rollout. As I mentioned, we, we certainly have not encouraged our volunteers to, to not get vaccinated, given how important it is in terms of controlling this, this virus. But by maintaining an open relationship with them where we communicate regularly, um, if it's safe to do so, we can encourage them to perhaps defer that a little bit, particularly if it's very important from a, a study perspective. But if they are going ahead with the, the vaccine or when they go ahead with the vaccine, making sure we're aware of when that's happening so we can get them in um, and collect as much information as possible immediately prior to doing that. Um, we've certainly made sure we've encouraged our volunteers to do the right thing from a, from a public health perspective and, and encourage them to seek out uh, avenues to, to get the licensed vaccine. And I guess to also make sure that, um, that the vaccines, if it's a vaccine study in question, that the vaccine that they receive on study is not yet a licensed vaccine, so it doesn't replace the vaccine that they should still go and seek from public health perspective, um, and that they also need to make sure they take the right public health measures and employ mitigation strategies um, to ensure they stay safe and not assume they're protected from what may be, uh, I guess, a, a placebo or, or a vaccine that's, uh, that's not yet approved. Um, as I say, basically the, the main thing that's been really important is the communication, both with uh, sponsors uh, as well as with the participants, regulators, public health, that there's been so many key stakeholders that have enabled us to, to do this successfully and uh, that we've maintained open communication with throughout to, to make sure that, uh, again, our primary concern is uh, the safety of our volunteers and we've been able to do that, um, but also keeping our staff safe, keeping our business able to operate so that we can continue the really important work that has been uh, the, the early phase trials on, on so far, at least at my side, of uh, six COVID-19 vaccines. And, and likely to be many more. And in doing so, I think we've certainly contributed to, to the development of these vaccines and uh, started the ball rolling in terms of getting them out there to, to hopefully make a difference on a global scale. And uh, I think that's my last slide. So I'll hand over to Jeffrey. Excellent. Thank you so much, Paul. And, and thanks, uh, Tricia, uh, earlier on as well. Yeah, I think oh, yeah, one of the uh, key elements that has been emphasized and I probably couldn't emphasize enough is, is, is the keyword communication. And uh, we are very privileged uh, to hear that, you know, there is a, a vast degree of uh, difference in terms of the vaccination rollout, uh, both across the U.S. and, uh, and Australia as well. Hence, uh, it is very fortunate for us, uh, Nucleus Network, to be able to really leverage on this information and kind of really see how best we can then support um, our clientele in terms of uh, really uh, maintaining a, a high quality of delivering uh, clinical trials, uh, which is part of their clinical development plan itself. So it, it goes without saying that the importance of open and ongoing communication is not limited to external stakeholders, as we have discussed so far, such as you know discussions with our sponsors and clients, having reached out to regulatory bodies or having that continuous uh, ongoing engagement with our participants. Instead, uh, internal communication and collaboration between Nucleus Network being a multi-site operator is also incredibly critical. For example, uh, Nucleus has fortnightly meetings uh, with senior management, uh, where senior management team across all three sites of ours, whereby we discuss the latest COVID-19 landscape and related uh, impact on day-to-day -day operations. These uh, continuous updates allow business operations to take on board learnings that could be applied to mitigate possible challenges in future trials itself. So there's cross-pollination of lessons learned. And one of the unique offering that Nucleus has being a multi-site operator is that sites can act as a backup sites or as part of a multi-site trial to achieve greater diversity in COVID-19 vaccination status of participant if required, whilst providing our client with the same management experience itself. So that is one of uh, the unique uh, point that we have been able to leverage given our uh, experience and the data that we have collected to date as have been displayed by both uh, Tricia and Paul earlier on. 
Just to slightly further expand on that in terms of the multi-site advantage, and whilst conducting a clinical trial under an IND remains the gold standard by and large for most people, there are several advantages of conducting clinical trials in Australia. And this uh, summary slide that really highlights uh, three of the key components of some of the advantages that can be considered. Uh, firstly is speed. And this is primarily supported by a streamlined regulatory framework in Australia that A, does not require an IND submission. B, it only requires a limited CMC package. And that is how uh, the timeline for preparation for submissions in, uh, submission is truncated significantly. And that, as a result, uh, brings us to an average approval time frame of usually four to five weeks from initial submission to obtaining approval from the IRB, or what we locally call in Australia, the Human Research Ethics Committee. Secondly, of course, though the timeline of submission and approval is truncated, uh, the quality is not compromised. Australia abides by the ICH guidelines and data from Australia can be used to support international regulatory application, which includes both the FDA as well as EMA as well. And last but not the least, a very practical component in terms of Australia's advantage is its cost efficiency. And that is due by and large to the favorable exchange rate and more importantly, the generous R&D tax incentive. And what I mean by the R&D tax incentive, um, there are two models whereby for uh, the first model, uh, there's up to a 43.5% refundable tax offset for entities, for qualifying entities with a group turnover of less than 20 million Australian dollars. And second to that, uh, there is also a 38.5% non-refundable tax offset for entities uh, with a group turnover of more than 20 million Australian dollars. So these are just some of the advantages uh, that Australia has to offer uh, in comparison to uh, the US uh, through the IND uh, pathway. I think it goes without saying that sufficient preparation is key to a successful clinical trial. And this is definitely true, particularly in the current pandemic climate where the global landscape is constantly evolving. As such, um, I certainly hope that our presentation uh, today has provided further insight into how Nucleus has maintained fluidity under the current climate. To ensure timely delivery and maintenance of a quality outcome for clinical trials during this vaccination rollout period, we definitely encourage early and continuous engagement in the lead up to the initiation of a clinical program, as this would enable early identification of potential challenges and thus the development of solutions to circumvent them. As we conclude, I would just like to highlight a few uh, takeaways for us to consider. Firstly, as we consider running trials during this vaccination rollout period, participant safety remains as our utmost priority as we have already discussed uh, with some of the earlier presentation. Secondly, High quality delivery of clinical trials can still be achieved with sufficient preparation and early engagement with clinical trial sites. I would like to also emphasize that the number of people registering and wanting to be part of a clinical trial continues to be at an all time high. However, the education piece is key to really educate uh, a new demographic of uh, participants in terms of what it means to do a clinical trial under the current pandemic climate itself. And thirdly, the changing landscape as vaccination is being rolled out means open two-way communication with participants. Those that are enrolled and to be enrolled is equally, if not more important than ever before. And lastly, Given Nucleus Network's multi-site offering across both Australia and the US, we're able to offer clinical sites with high and low levels of vaccinated, recovered, and naive participants to suit the requirements of various uh, different trial protocols. So I thank you for your time once again, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you and to take uh, questions uh, along the way post this presentation. So I pass the time back to Josh. Thank you. Oh, 
No, sorry. Um, no, thank you very much. Just a reminder for the audience, in order to ask questions, you can send them in via the questions widget. Just type them into the box in the top right-hand corner of your screen and click Submit. Um, but we've had some more come in already. Um, we've got one here asking, how has COVID impacted the ability to recruit for trials? Uh, it's Paul here. I guess I, I, I might take that one. Um, we, we've heard a, a little bit about some of the factors that contributed there. Obviously, with uh, changes in the in the situation, and I'm speaking, of course, about uh, Australia, we, we had um, some certainly faced some challenges along the way. I think at certain times, particularly when the pandemic was just kicking off, we had uh, quite a bit of apprehension in terms of uh, people even being a little bit loath to leave their homes. Um, with the circulating vaccine misinformation. I think at times we had people be quite uh, hesitant to participate in things like a vaccine study. Um, and so we, we obviously had to address that with, uh, you know, as seemed to be a fairly common theme in the presentation, lots of communication to, to address some of those concerns. We had to make sure that our volunteers knew that they would be safe and could attend our clinical trial site to participate in our studies in a in a very safe way. And we also had to address some of the misinformation about vaccines uh, being rushed or there being ulterior motives or not being sufficient preclinical data, for example. So, you know, we were very proactive in that communication uh, on a, a broad and, and a, I guess, a narrow scale as well to individual participants to address their concerns. And in doing so, we, um, you know, addressed any any potential challenges and have been able to very successfully recruit, you know, not only our, our COVID vaccine studies, but uh, a number of other studies in other therapeutic areas. So I guess it was all about being able to address the specific concerns there, mostly via um, adequate communication. And in doing so, we're able to, to do those things successfully. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, here's another one here. Uh, can Nucleus Network rescue um, Yeah. Can Nucleus Network rescue studies that have com commenced elsewhere? Yeah, I'll, I'll probably take that one. Uh, so this is Jeffrey here. Um, yeah, to that question, uh, the simple answer to that is yes. Um, I suppose uh, that. To, to further qualify uh, and to further, further perform feasibility, uh, as, we've in, uh, as we've alluded to earlier on, is that uh, engagement piece which needs to occur for us to perform a full feasibility in terms of the timeline. And of course, when we say a rescue site, uh, because we do have a footprint across both Australia and the US, so it would be good for us to understand um, what's, what's the timeline that uh, this client or the sponsor is actually um, earmarking or has planned for the program itself. And then following from there, uh, it would then be dependent on the uh, actual regulatory pathway as well that is going to be most suited for that program to, to be able to initiate uh, a rescue site uh, at the quickest possible time as well. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Um, this next one, um, as a few of you may know, uh, Melbourne just announced a, another lockdown. Um, how will that affect recruiting for studies? Yeah, look, I'm happy to take that one. It's Cameron here. Um, so we've been fortunate sort of throughout sort of the height for Australia, the pandemic last year. Um, we did receive a sort of essential status from the Victorian government. So essentially what that means that despite, you know, the strictest lockdowns, we were able to continue operations um, throughout the lockdown period. And it was very much sort of the, the thought process that was applied that absolutely, obviously, COVID-19, terrible pan, pandemic globally, but there's also still a lot of sort of unmet medical needs out there. And so certainly ensuring that clinical trials maintain um, sort of the momentum that they've sort of up and running, you know, that was critical that that, that we didn't cease. Um, so in terms of the lockdown in Melbourne at the moment, um, we're largely still business as usual um, in terms of participants are coming into the clinic for screening, our outpatients are still being conducted, our inpatients are still being conducted. Um, it's just that we have our participants carry a letter with them to state that they are uh, involved in a clinical trial and that's the reason for their travel. Um, so, yeah, thank you for that question. Thank you very much, Cameron. Um, just a reminder to the attendees, you can still submit questions via our Q&A widget that box in the top right-hand corner. Just type whatever question you have and click Submit. Um, this next one here is asking, 
do you think the vaccine rollout in Australia will accelerate? It's Paul here. I'll take uh, that question. Um, there's there's no question that it will accelerate. We saw a, a number of challenges that have contributed to a relatively slow um, rollout thus far. And, uh, you know, a lot of good work has been done to addressing that. Um, it, it certainly needs to accelerate because I think our, our vulnerability has been exposed with this latest cluster uh, in the state of uh, Victoria at the moment. And um, given how slow our rollout has been, I think, uh, you know, the, the majority of the country remains highly susceptible. And so um, I think some of the complacency and the perception of low risk uh, is now starting to be turned around. And I think also the fact that we've seen, you know, other countries that have had exceptional control now also struggle somewhat, you know, for example, ta uh, Taiwan. So I, I think our, our rollout will improve um, and it's uh, certainly couldn't come uh, sooner. Thanks very much. Um, with one more here um, asking, are staff vaccinated at the clinic? That's probably a good one for you, Trisha, considering where the US is, yeah. is up to in their rollout in Australia. Yeah. <laughs> we, heard, we were very excited to prioritize our staff for vaccination, as I spoke um, earlier. Um, yes, our staff, anybody that obviously wanted to get vaccinated, um, and, and the, the general majority are across both the clinic as well as administrative um, side, we are all fully vaccinated. It's a very nice feeling. <laughs> very grateful. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, that's um, all the questions we had to come in. Um, so that just leaves me to thank Cameron. Patricia, Paul, and Jeffrey for what was a great presentation, and to Quotient um, to Nucleus Network for sponsoring the session. To the attendees, you will receive an email shortly telling you how you can access the on-demand version of this webinar, or you can access this through our website, which is www.business-review-webinars.com. We look forward to sharing further webinars with you, so please do keep an eye out on the website just mentioned and follow us on Twitter at BR Webinars for daily updates and join our LinkedIn group, Business Review Webinars. Thank you all once again for tuning in, and I hope you all have a brilliant day.